think I'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, or just good noon, I guess. It's noon here in Mississippi. My name is Katie McKee, and I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. I am delighted to welcome you to today's South Talk. Thanks to Afton Thomas, Associate Director of Programs at the Center, who organizes the series, to Lily Slaughter, who helps make them happen, and to Rebecca Cleary, our communication specialist, who makes sure you know what is going on in our virtual audience. Before we begin today's presentation, a few announcements. Unfortunately, next week's South Talk with Zoe Burkholder is postponed until next semester due to Dr. Burkholder's illness. You know what it is. I don't even have to say it anymore. Do you remember the early days when we would say, I think they have COVID. Now we all just say it when we have it because we've got it. So she has COVID and will be unable to travel, but will join us in the spring. But the remainder of our programming for this semester is on schedule. Tonight at 6.30 at the Malco Theater on Sisk, we will be screening Jasmine Lopez's film, Silent Beauty. And on December 2nd, in our Barnard Observatory home, we will be hosting our own fall documentary showcase of student work beginning at 6 p.m. Both of these events are free and open to the public, and we would love to see you all there. That'll finish us up for the semester. We will then transition into full-on end of the semester mode, but we will be back in January with another exciting lineup of talks and events, including the Oxford Conference for the Book, scheduled for March 29th through the 31st, 2023. An incredible number to say out loud as the year, but that's what it will be. So mark your calendars. Our spring programming will continue interweaving this semester's theme, Race in the Classroom. We have paid attention over various events this term to the stakes of understanding fully the history of race in America, particularly in the U.S. South, and particularly within the spaces we have dedicated to education. Today's speaker is a perfect complement to that focus. Dr. Tamara Boberf is, has a doctorate in human development and psychology from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and is professor and Louise R. Noun Chair in Gender, Women's, and Sexuality Studies at Grinnell College in Grinnell, Iowa. She is the author of Behind the Mask of the Strong Black Woman, Voice and the Embodiment of a Costly Performance, and most recently, the book she is here to talk with us about today, To Live More Abundantly, Black Collegiate Women, Howard University, and the Audacity of Dean Lucy Diggs Slow. Today's talk is the result of a partnership between the Center for the Study of Southern Culture and the University of Georgia Press to bring to our campus leading scholars in the field of Southern Studies. Please join me in welcoming today's guest. Thank you. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. And I just want to say my thanks and thanks to Zoom for accommodating me. I just got out of class. I, I let them out a little early. And I am in Grinnell, Iowa, centrally located halfway between LA and New York City. Um, so I'd like to thank Dr. McKee um, and also Afton Thomas for doing all the arrangements for this um, visit, this virtual visit. And then Candace Lawrence, who's the publicist for the University of Georgia Press, has also been instrumental and the press that published my book earlier this year. So um, I'm a qualitative sociologist here in Grinnell, Iowa, and over my, um, my career, I've been interested in what I call Black women's gender projects. So in a society that some Black feminists have described as creating tight spaces for Black women and crooked rooms, my questions have often been, how do they create ways of being that center their agency, their community, their sense of well-being, and even their joy? And so right now, the title slide that I have includes the cover of my book, and the text focuses on belonging. And I have to say, at the outset, that was not the focus of my work. Uh, the research that I did, but increasingly it's become one of the major takeaways of the, of the narrative. And so I'm going to start with just what belonging is. Um, I think we all can appreciate that it's really important. Um, we're social beings. To belong is to be a part of, to be seen, to be known, to be valued for who we are and what we bring to a community. And in higher education, as Dr. McKee has signaled, um, this has been a problem. Um, I would argue that although belonging is necessary for a full experience in higher education in order to get really what it can give you to have the development and the growth, 
Um, it's at the heart of our struggles around inclusion because we have failed to um, enable lots of people from minoritized backgrounds to belong in our classrooms. And I would say for Black women in particular, it's been a really elusive quality of their education. So this has been a problem not only at places like Grinnell and the University of Mississippi, persistently white institutions, um, where well into the 20th century, Black women were granted limited access to enroll at these institutions and often not allowed to reside on campus. But even at HBCUs, where highly gendered notions of social responsibility outweighed an interest in Black women's interior lives, their personal aspirations, their individuality, their joys, and their needs. And I'll just say quickly that in, 19, in the 1950s, there was a Black um, woman psychologist, Jeannie Noble, and I thought she really gave voice to this problem where she said that you know, racial respectability, the notion that Black women had to always think about the race first and to meet community needs, resulted in educations in which education for self-fulfillment or personal development was deemed, quote, more of a luxury than a necessity for Black women. Um, but as I will discuss in my time with you, Dean Slow felt very differently about this situation, and she sought to provide a full education in which Black women felt centered and seen on their own terms, as well as believed in, affirmed, and nurtured deeply. So um, before I talk more about what she did um, and its impact on Black women um, at Howard University, I want to say a little bit about Dean Slow herself. So I'm going to hope that my mouse works with me here. Okay, come on, respond. Okay, here. So this is just a slide that includes some of the things that make me think of the word audacity, which is a part of my title, but it's also the way I want you to think about Dean Slow and the work that I'm going to tell you about that she accomplished. So I think it's really helpful for understanding who she was and what she did. So audacity, if you look at Miriam Webster online, defines is defined as intrepid boldness as well as a bold and arrogant disregard of normal restraints. And I would argue, and, I, and this is not a controversial claim, that Dean Slow demonstrated this quality over and over throughout her life. And here are some images that reflect it. Reflect it. So she entered Howard University in 1904. She was born in 1883. And she was the first young woman from what became Frederick Douglass High School in Baltimore to earn an academic scholarship to Howard University. There, she excelled academically. She majored, majored in English, and she was an avid and gifted tennis player who was also the president of the Howard women's tennis team. Um, in her senior year, she worked with eight other Howard women to found the first African-American sorority in the country, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. She both co-wrote the Constitution and served as the organization's first president. And in 1908, she graduated valedictorian of her class of 16. And after graduation, Lucy Slow became a well-regarded high school English and history teacher in the Baltimore and then the Washington DC areas, all while competing in tennis singles and doubles tournaments. And in 1917, she became the first black woman to hold a national sports title. Um, and while she was doing this, she was becoming uh, more and more of a recognized administrator. And in 1919, so the image that I have, I think it's to your right or your left, I can't determine. Um, with all these screens, um, but this is letterhead from the first junior high school in Washington, D.C., and she was asked, she was recruited to serve as, as its first um, principal. And then three years later, in the fall of 1922, so exactly 100 years ago, she returned to her alma mater at age 39 to become its dean of women and its first full-time woman administrator. So um, if you're like me, um, I had no idea what a Dean of Woman was when I started this project about, um, ooh, I went too far, um, about seven years ago. And so let me just give you a little history of the, of the field. So although we don't use the term now, the Dean of Women profession still impacts college life deeply um, today. So if I say Dean of Women, often people will think about meddlesome, prudish older women who are hired to monitor and curtail women's fun and independence. But actually this image is quite out of step with what Dean Slow and many of her colleagues sought to accomplish um, and actually institutionalized at HBCUs and PWIs in the first half of the 20th century. So um, from 1910 until about 1960, upwards of 90% of co-educational institutions had deans of women. And this is what they were. They were the first cabinet level women administrators in higher education. 
and they are the foremothers to our current VPs of student affairs. So the whole student affairs profession was nurtured into being by these deans of women. Now they were brought in, so we understand that VPs of student affairs are tasked with overseeing the residential and co-curricular lives of undergraduates. But deans of women were the ones who initiated this idea that to be well educated, you didn't just have to have an academic curriculum that was rigorous for the time that you spend with other students in a classroom with faculty members, but you needed to have a rich social curriculum. So all the extracurricular activities, the sports, the newspapers, the sororities, the clubs, the volunteering, they argued that that was what made for a full education. And that is the purview now of, of student affairs. So it's a common way of thinking about the residential experience, but a hundred years ago, it was the birth child of these women, these deans of women. So um, not only did these, did these deans of women introduce a broader sense of what college was and should provide um, to students, they often served in a role not unlike our current chief diversity officers. And I say that because 100 years ago in 1920, women constituted 47.3%, so just under 50% of the student body. And when I share that with my students, they're completely floored. All right, now granted only about, I don't know, 10% of maybe students in that age group went to college, but still, I mean, women were present. Women were avidly seeking a college education, but they were unwelcome on most of the campuses. They attended campuses that were founded for men, run by men, and did not necessarily want them there, but needed their tuition dollars. So if you think about the composition of the academic curriculum, the constitution of the faculty and the administrators, the prominence of, of athletic teams, fraternities, these iconic parts of higher education, they were all designed without women students in mind. So what deans of women did in this chief diversity officer kind of role was that they focused on advocating for women and nurturing a sense of institutional belonging for them. They wanted college women to have what an educational historian, Jana Nadifer, describes as, and I have it on the left, but I'm just going to take out a piece of it, the feeling that you are welcome in the entire community and not ignored, demeaned, harmed, treated as a social stereotype or otherwise made to feel threatened or peripheral. So in a sense, she's describing unbelonging. But what I love about this, this description is that it reminds us of the many ways in which we signal to certain students that this is not a place for you. And that maybe explains some of our retention issues that we still have issues with um, today. Um, so these deans of women um, believed in advocating for women students, not a paternalistic surveillance of them. And they knew very intimately because most of these deans of women had um, not just bachelor's degrees, but master's and, and at times doctoral degrees. So they had gone through, they were parts of the first generations of women to get higher education. They knew intimately that without their presence and advocacy, these higher ed institutions would continue to be in the future what they had been in the past, institutions for men. And so um, I want to start getting into Dean Slow's version of this. And so in 1937, in the month before she died, Dean Slow had this essay published in Opportunity Magazine, and it's called The Colored Girl Enters College, What Should She Expect? And what I want to signal right now is that in this question that she has as her title, she was really pushing schools to um, to take responsibility for being responsive to Black women. She wasn't asking Black women to lower their expectations, but she was pressing institutions to recognize that they had an important constituency that they needed to, to attend to. So in this article, she argues for Black women to have opportunities to exercise and develop their initiative and their self-direction. And, um, you know, I'm part of this self-talk series, and I just want to acknowledge briefly that um, Dean Slow was a Southerner. She was born in Berryville, Virginia. And then um, she was also off orphaned by the age of six. And then she moved with her paternal aunt to Baltimore. Um, the women that she taught at Howard that she helped to nurture largely came from the South. And I just want to read to you um, a little bit about how she saw this population and its particular needs. She wrote in this article, when Negro women go to college, they usually go from segregated communities. Frequently, Negro women come from homes where conservatism in reference to women's place in the world is of the most extreme sort, or the, of the most extreme sort exists. I'm sorry, I missed something there. 
Many parents still believe that the definition of women found in an 18th century dictionary is still true today. Woman, the female of man, see man. Many of them have been brought up on the antiquated philosophy of St. Paul in reference to women's place in the scheme of things and all too frequently have been influenced by the philosophy of patient waiting rather than the philosophy of developing their talents to the fullest extent. All right, and so she was really concerned that the women coming to Howard were very well versed in what she called the psychology of accepting what is taught rather than the psychology of trying to view unsatisfactory conditions. So whether or not you agree with what her representation of Southern Black womanhood was, you can hear her critique of social and cultural conditions that she felt constrained Black women's agency. And this critique really much, very much shaped her view of what college should do. So rather than hamper students with useless rules and regulations designed to control their conduct, conduct she believed that schools should provide necessary opportunities for these women to make independent choices. And she has this wonderful statement, when a college woman cannot be trusted to go shopping without a chaperone, she is not likely to develop powers of leadership. So now that we have a sense of who she was, sort of the profession she belonged to and her vision, what I wanna do is to give you a sense of the evidence I have of what she did and how it impacted black women a century ago. So um, I'm a qualitative sociologist and what initially drew me to this project was this concept of the new Howard woman. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. So um, I say exactly a hundred years ago as I'm speaking because I had the, the really honor of going to Howard University last month to talk about this work. And it was just so moving for me to know that literally a century ago, Dean Slow was starting this work that I think is really still um, very, that echoes through a lot of the leadership that Black women experience um, at that campus. So um, in the fall term of 1922, when she had just gotten back to her campus, but in this new role, Dean Slow started speaking about this gender project. She called together the women of campus and invited them to consider becoming what she called new Howard women. While we don't have a copy of the address, and I have to say, um, Dean Slow's archives are unique in the sense that they are, they are, she's very well documented. I mean, we have letters, we have reports that she wrote, we have all these newspaper clippings, quite a few photos, but we don't have a copy of this particular address, but women students, and I think that's really significant, took it upon themselves to document this interaction with the new dean, and they wrote about it in the alumni magazine. And so one of the students was a junior at the time, and she was an undergraduate editor of that alumni journal. And in her article, she conveyed her own and her classmates' enthusiasm about this new educator and her vision, vision of a collegiate Black womanhood. And this is what, uh, and I'll just sort of highlight some of the things that the student wrote, um, what I find striking is how enthusiastically Neil writes about the Dean. She describes Dean Slow's presence as ushering in a new day. And she refers to Dean Slow as a long awaited answer to a spiritual need in the life of women here. And more specifically, Neil paraphrases Dean Slow, quoting that the new Howard woman is a woman who is intellectually alert, physically alert and of extreme culture and refinement. And the student ends her recounting of the meeting with a vow. We, the women of Howard University, welcome Dean Slow with eager open arms and consecrate ourselves to the sacred task of evolving the new Howard woman. All right, um, I've been teaching for 27 years. I've never had a response to anything I've said that's been at that level, but this is, I think it's a resounding endorsement of what Dean Slow was, pre was presenting to the women students. However, um, when I first read this and sort of tried to hear it in my mind, it sounded like an embrace of the Black feminine respectability um, sort of norms that some scholars see as the dominant Black feminine project of the early 20th century, where Black women are, would be always mindful of how they came across, particularly to whites, and trying to always um, signal that they weren't the inferior beings that white people in their evaluations expected Black women to be. And so I thought that maybe this she was just playing into respectability, but in short measure, I began to question that initial sense quite deeply. And what's become clear to me is that this phrase, this new Howard woman was a rallying cry for not just for a new black femininity, but a femininity that was visible, vocal, proud, and self-defining. 
Um, and as demonstrated through some of the things I'm going to show in a second, um, students' references to the dean's work and the uh, and its impact. And here is where the student newspaper is just a wonderful treasure trove for me because there are all these articles showing what the ideal was, but then also how it it really came about through an intergenerational collaboration that was largely and eagerly taken up by the women students. So this is where things get, I think, really delicious or where I always smile and I hope you'll join with me in this. So what I have here is an invitation that was also reprinted in the alumni magazine by these women editors. So within a month of her outreach to the students, Dean Slow organized a gathering on campus that would make the new Howard woman public and would become the signature event of her 15 year tenure. So between 1922 and 1937 at Howard University. And this is the, the iconic, the women's dinner. So every first Friday evening in November, Howard women students and alumni gathered to hear inspiring speeches, often from other alumni who were making strides in fields such as law and business, the arts, and also in, federal, in the federal government. And these interviews would come together. They were engaged in humorous interclass contests, um, but men were excluded. And what I have here is the letter of non-invitation that Dean Slow and a spirited group of 31 young women penned and sent to all the men of campus. We mean faculty, students, and the last white person to be the president of Howard University. So all the men, all right? So it's dated Wednesday, November 1st and it's addressed broadly. And each time I read this letter, I have the same reaction. I'm grinning, I'm laughing. I find myself completely drawn into the energy of the words. And I, I hope you can see they're big enough on your screens and I'll read you some of the, I think the, the best pull lines. Um, it's, it's bold, it's teasing, it's confident. And I love that it's not only excluding the men, but that the women are insisting that they are bringing into existence a new tradition and that it's doing something both meaningful and, 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 and beautiful. They are bringing to existence a 20th century wonder. Now, this is a huge claim. And remember, it's being made preemptively before the event even happened. The event is going to happen on November 3rd for the first time. So this is audacity in the best of ways in my mind. And as, it's, as, as if it's not enough to not invite the men, the women offer this, 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 this little concession that they will allow the men to be spectators, although they will be limited to a particular time in the evening and can only view from the balcony. And again, the women self-assuredly claim that the men will be in awe as they see, quote, how much fun we women can have when you men are not present. And I hope you can um, appreciate the belonging that the women felt to be able to do this. You know, they're self-assured, collaborative, and they are definitely dreaming big. Um, as anticipated, um, I'm happy to say the dinner did take place and it was a resounding success by the students' own accounts. Um, unfortunately, we don't have good images of the dinner during the time that Dean Slow was um, in office, but we have these lovely photos um, courtesy of Skirlock's um, studio, which was, um, I guess, the leading black photography studio in Washington, DC. And there are these incredible um, images um, that, they, that they did, to that they took um, recording black life um, in this um, important city. And so these are two images from the 1940s. Um, and also there's um, the, 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 the little um, text is about, and it is an account of the first dinner. Um, so I'll just read a little bit from it. So a student reporter in the alumni um, journal wrote, the whole affair give, gave women a new conception of what it means to be a student or an alumna of Howard University. And what I find remarkable is how audible the reported pleasure of the women was. It shows up, if you can read the text here, it shows up in singing and in chants and speeches that were embodied, voiceful, proud, and community building. And I would say, true to what the women students claimed in their letter of non-invitation to the men, they were in fact bringing into an existence audibly and visibly this 20th century wonder. Um, I also want to highlight that this was intergenerationally significant, um, this women's dinner, um, to both current students and to graduates. So as one student author detailed, the inaugural gathering was a meeting of, quote, youth and experience as alumni threw off their cares and problems. 
And over the 15 years of her tenure, this dinner brought together somewhere between 250 and 500 Howard women on this annual basis. These dinners were inspirational as well as playful. In showcasing Dean Slow's pride in Black women, the dinner allowed them to display creative self-expression and to be seen on their own terms. Um, they showed their school pride by competing to see which class attended in the highest numbers. And I think one year, 75% of the senior women were present. They marched, they did stunts, they called on people to give extemporaneous speeches. Um, this is probably one of my favorite competitions, which was won by the sophomore class. It featured a conductor who used a broom as a wand and directed an orchestra made of combs, tin pans, and bicycle pumps. All right, um, and there's this really important um, Black feminist historian, Lakeisha Simmons, who talks about these spaces as pleasure geographies. You know, in a situation where you have Jim Crow and you have sexism, what are the spaces that Black women create where they can just be, you know? And what I love is that these geographies are often spaces where women and girls are working together to get, create spaces where they can exhale, where they can enjoy, where they can revel in a much fuller humanity than they typically can. And it was through this inspiration, community, and fun that Slow chose to awaken to um, a woman's consciousness, which she thought was prerequisite for launching this new Howard woman idea into the world. Now, I, there's another reason why I wanna call this dinner audacious. Um, of all the spaces on campus to hold this thing that had never happened before, and to tell the men that the only men in attendance would be waiters, they went to the newly opened dining hall. They took the best real estate on campus for this, all right? And so what this all suggests to me is that they were far from emotionally guarded or concerned about maintaining a stiff armor-like propriety around each other or onlookers. They were not maintaining a task. And these women, I think, were being self-defining and self-respecting. This dinner did not align them with respectability. It led with Black women's audacity. All right, and, and so, and this original um, design was defended by the women over the 15 years of Dean Slow's tenure. Um, in the newspaper, you hear one woman saying, responding to men who are questioning, you know, the, their exclusion. And she wrote to the men, this has been labeled undemocratic by some enterprising young men Yet cannot the women enjoy themselves with no men present as the latter often do without the women, without being branded as undemocratic. Another woman at a later point says that when women considered opening this event up to the men, they were very audible in their opposition. They rallied, she says, to oppose it because at last they were doing something um, on their own. Um, there's another example given where two men, I think there were two men deans, all right, who appeared at the balcony. And even though they were allowed to do that for a little bit of the women's dinner, um, the, the evening of the women's dinner, they encountered what this um, journalist wrote, lusty songs, and uh, they were greeted with lusty songs and the arrival, and they appeared to have, and these songs, excuse me, appeared to have frightened both of the men away. So you just get a sense of how embodied and how sort of bold these women feel when they're um, among their own. And over and over, the women students recognize the importance of Dean Slow in making this space available, this space where they could take up space. Um, in fact, um, she got a new nickname, Dean Swift. So sort of playing on her name. And one woman um, after the, the Dean had died said, we saw so many customs change that in a sense, we had to call her something else. We had to recognize how much she was doing to make this a space that we wanted to be in. So um, I want to also show other things that she did. So she didn't just have this iconic dinner. Um, she also got the physical environment to become responsive to the women. So um, when she started her tenure, three, quarter, three quarters of Howard women lived off campus. And part of her educational vision was to have dorms to support not only their sort of their, their, their lodging on campus, but their opportunities for co-curricular learning through self-governance, sponsored activities, and, and, the, and, the, and the living in community. And so she lobbied the president. And then finally, almost 10 years later, in the fall of 1931, um, Howard built three state-of-the-art dormitories in what would become what is now known as Tubman Quadrangle. And they did not skimp on amenities. 
The original quad included a dining room, beauty salon, coffee shop, infirmary, laundry facilities, elevators, and hot running water. And these state-of-the-art structures were able to house about 300 women. And they were a point of pride for Howard, for Dean Slow, and the women. And so what I have here, so Deans of Women created this professional organization, um, the National Association of Deans of Women. And Dean Slow was the first African-American member and in 1932, just a few months after these dorms opened, the annual meeting of the NAD, NADW was in Washington, D.C., and she extended an invitation to mostly white deans to come and see this pride. And um, I don't know if I, my mouse will pick it up, but this is Dean Slow here with her chin up. And, I, and what I love is that it's a celebration of Black women's accomplishment and not a situation where white women are engaging in some kind of charity or trying to lift up a black woman. Um, they really are standing as equals. Um, so not only was this quad um, you know, materially sort of well done, it also included many things that were part of um, helping black women to sort of grow into their potential. So Dean Slow's office oversaw the management of these dorms initially and her staff included a woman physician a dietitian and college educated dorm directors. She was very insistent that the women who would be guiding the women sort of on the ground in the dorms would have had a BA and, a, and would be liberally educated or have a liberal arts you know, background. Um, she wanted the, the feeling of these dorms to encourage a solidarity as well as women's independence um, demonstrated through purposeful activities rather than through infantilizing rules and regulations. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a bit more sense of what I think is really important as a part of belonging. Like when you feel when you feel that you belong, you feel that you can sort of extend yourself and sort of just be free in your movements. And one thing that was not um, that was commonly found in coeducational institutions is that you had a women's women's athletic league. And in 1931, that began. Um, at Howard University, and these this is these were not competitive sports in the sense that you have necessarily colleges college teams of women you know competing with other teams of women from other institutions. They were intramural, but I would say that the intramural reach was really profound because these intramural programs had this philosophy: a game for every girl, and every girl in a game. So the idea when you had an, an athletic director here, and in this picture, you see the women's um, field hockey squad and the woman in the back who's right in the middle with the black shirt. Um, this is Mary Rose Reeves Allen, who was the director of women's physical education for 42 years from 1925 to 1967. And so she oversaw working with Dean Slow this whole slate of intramural sports that included archery, swimming, basketball, tennis, soccer, and field hockey. And so this is in this picture, like once again, I see women in relaxed poses, I see women together, and I see women knowing that, they're, that they, this is also a space for them. Um, another image, um, that I'm going to show you is May. It's the May Festival. Also something that was not, uh, that, something that you found across the country in coeducational and um, women's colleges. So the same Mary Rose Reeves Allen, who I just mentioned, who was in the picture just before, she would organize these May Fest festivals with the women students. And these were week-long displays of undergraduate women's planning and creativities. So these were elaborate pageants that were the culmination of a lot of work where students would produce, would write and produce original plays. They would have hand-sewn costumes. They would choreograph dances. They would construct props. They wrote songs and, that's, and also engage in acrobatic stunts. And this photo from 1936 that shows the May Queen and her court, it attracted over 2,000 attendees. Um, in this next slide, I want to give you a sense of in the school newspaper, because I think you know that's where you have students sort of saying, this is what it feels like to be here. And here are three um, um, headlines from articles from the Hilltop, the Howard University School newspaper. Um, to, the, to my left, which I hope is also your left, 
there's a 1936 Valentine's Day party that challenged gender norms because attendees invited their own escort and it was described very supportively in the newspaper and I'll quote I'll pull from it reads the girl the girls did all of the requesting of their dance partners at first they were a little shy with a question mark right after that but by the time that the tin horns and confetti were distributed everyone had caught the spirit of the party um, a few years earlier in February 1932 college women, women presented a talent night which featured original skits and poetry, dance and music routines, dramatic readings and acrobatic feats. And what I thought was important is that this was described as, quote, a wonderful exhibition of cooperation, both among the girls and with the faculty. So once again, that this is an intergenerational labor or ideal or this belonging is reaching, you know, the young women, but it's in with the, um, the, the support of a few women faculty who were um, on the campus. And then um, the last headline comes from the fall of 1934 and the faculty, excuse me, the women's faculty club organized a party for the college women. And you might think that this would be a place where, you know, I mean, it would sort of defer to older women's senses of what should happen. You would think that it would be where propriety was emphasized. Um, no. The evening, as the article describes, included a Chinese gong, peanuts tossed to be caught, shouts and cries, games, stunts, a pretzel eating contest, a competition to construct clothing out of newspaper, and some kind of drawing competition, which they did while blindfolded. So once again, another example that fun was at the center of what brought these women together. And so what I think this fund shows is that, or emphasizes, is that Howard women were not unduly focused on how they were perceived, what, res what respectability would center, but how they could be self-defining in ways that included fun as well as purpose. So now we're going to shift tones to talk about um, Dean Slow's context, all right? So I said that she was the first cabinet level administrator at Howard University, as most deans of women were. And so um, to me, this is sort of like um, a day at work that doesn't feel really good. All right. So part of what it means to be a pioneer is that you are the first, which means that there's no one like you in the room. And so this next photo, the photo that I have, shows Dean Slow not among the Howard women who were supporting her and benef benefiting from her, audac her, excuse me, her audacious vision of belonging, but her existence among the men administrator, some of whom were uncomfortable with her vision and her presence. So Dean Slow is left the center here. I don't know how to describe her look. I call it seething frustration and yet a steely commitment to persevere. And on her, on, to the, on the other side of the man with the camel hair coat is the president, the first black African-American man to lead Howard University, Mordecai Johnson. And he was also her nemesis. Um, he held to very conservative, regressive views about women. He believed that a good education should equip Howard women to be, quote, good wives and mothers. And to this end, he didn't think that they needed to take courses in what he called the male subjects of the social sciences. Um, there was a case of sexual harassment that um, came to Dean Slow's attention and she brought it to the president um, the decision that was made was to have the man not teach the subsequent quarter and to be sort of let go. He ended up staying for the rest of the year, and then he was given half his salary with which he used, with, which he used to complete his doctorate at another institution. All right. And so he, and, and Dean Slow, this view, this was an act of extreme betrayal. And when he reneged on what he had agreed upon as a course of action for dealing with this, um, this problematic faculty member. Um, and so in her view, um, Mordecai Johnson, President Johnson epitomized a problem that she found in higher education. And she characterized it, characterized it as the fact that the vast majority of Negro women are trained in colleges whose affairs are administered by men. And I would say that for three quarters of her time at Howard, she and President Johnson were at odds. And I'm gonna describe now what her friends and students termed, and this is a quote, a persecution that was continuous and heartless. So less than two years after the women's quad was built, he took away management 
her management of the women's dorms and he fired much of her staff, including the women doctor, the woman's doctor, the dietitian, and some of the dormitory directors. What I'm going to show you next is a letter that Dean Slow wrote to the Board of Trustees, and I'm going to explain the handwriting in a second. In April of 1933, right after these cuts were made known to her, she emphasized that by slashing her staff and putting the dorms under the treasurer's control, the board and President Johnson had, quote, destroyed in one day practically everything that I had built up over a period of 11 years, end quote. And furthermore, President Johnson tried to force her to live on campus, something that he would have asked no other administrator to do. Um, the Baltimore African American newspaper described this action as, quote, purely and solely punitive and a technique for the punishing of a woman who apparently does not ride on the bandwagon, end quote. Dean Slow herself described the dwelling this way. The house is situated on an unpaved, blind street next to the university dump. Trash and dirt are hauled to this dump every day and burned. A more unsightly, unattractive, and unsanitary place could not have been chosen as a suitable residence for the Dean of Women of Howard University. And she was absolutely right. This was treatment that was unjust as well as humiliating. And in her reports and memos and appeals, it's so painful to read how she fought for her girls and all that she had built and how the Johnson administration and the Board of Trustees persisted in devaluing her in her efforts. So now I wanna draw your attention to the annotation. So Dean Slow's life partner was Mary Mamie Burrell, who was a well-known and well-respected drama and literature teacher at the Dunbar High School. And after Dean Slow's death, she did a lot to publicize her mistreatment by the university, by Howard University. They were in relationship for 25 years. And what she wrote, what she annotated on this copy this shows some of the handicaps put upon Dean Slow's work by a petty president reared and educated, not for education, but for the ministry. Um, when you belong to an institution, you fight for the things that make you feel like you belong. And so women students kept abreast of how Dean Slow was being treated and they protested the loss of personnel for the women's department. And in May 1933, so just a couple weeks after Dean Slow had written this letter that I just showed you to the Board of Trustees, the women students shared a letter that they had written to the president and the Board of Trustees, but they shared it directly with the Baltimore African American because, and this is what they said, they wanted no garbled account of what they were doing. This letter was signed by representatives of the majority of the women students on campus who they said were similarly outraged. They also wrote a second letter to the board, parts of which were again shared with the Baltimore African American, where they expressed their indignation at the board chair's attitude. So he was chastising them, saying that they didn't need to get involved in this affair, it had nothing to do with them. But they thought that the way that their dean was being treated was a signal for how men on campus saw black women, you know, as women who couldn't be trusted, as women who had to be sort of placed under surveillance, who had to be managed. And so what I love is the title of this article in the Baltimore African American, Howard Women Rebuke Trustee Boardhead. And this is a white man with the subtitle of the article, Dr. Flexner advised coeds to like it or get out. They urged him to resign his post. And they called out in this article what they saw as sex discrimination, which is not in keeping with the spirit of the day. And they spoke out directly against the attempt to place Dean Slow and the women students under paternalistic control. And I wanna just read to you what they thought it meant to attend Howard University. In this article, they state, Howard University is one place where Negroes may be trained for leadership. Your attitude nullifies all chances for Negroes to receive education for leadership or even self-respect at this school. We would rather have no school at all than to come under a regime of the slavery that is implied in your letter, as well as in your actions. In light of all of this, Dr. Flexner, we think that of your own volition, you ought to resign the position as president of the Board of Trustees of Howard University, for we feel that your continued presence thereon with the policies which you have set forth is detrimental to the progress of Negro education. And to boot, the red letter writer stated that the women had already procured the signatures of over 300 Howard women and alumni in support of their position. 
All right. Um, so Dean Slow died at age 54. In the summer of 1937, she took ill letters from peers reference her nervous exhaustion and a state of cumulative debilitation, which was likely the result of the intensity of the professional attacks that she had experienced for a decade. And on Thursday, October 21st, 1937, she died at her home of kidney failure. Her friends and her supporters charged President Johnson with, and this is a quote, hate, ill will, and malice toward her. They saw him as the cause of her early death, and they refused to allow him, his administration, or the Board of Trustees to have any official or symbolic role in her funeral, which was held on the campus, in the campus chapel on October 25th, 1937. Um, so a couple more slides, and then I'm, I'd love to hear your questions. All right, my mouse is not where I want it to be. All right. Oops. Oh, no, we're going the wrong way. All right. So Slow died just two weeks before what would have been the 16th annual women's dinner. And in its place, Howard Women held a tribute service. They also vowed to continue the tradition and true to their word, they did. So the photo that is on my right, which I think is on your right as well, is from 1938, the year after Dean Slow's death, when the dinner resumed with an important addition the Lucy Dick Slow Cup, which was awarded to, quote, the Howard Senior who approximates nearest the Lucy Slow ideals of scholarship, character, culture, refinement, and high public service to the student body. And then to make um, institutional space for Dean Slow, they also had uh, this memorial window. They, they collected monies for it and had it installed in the chapel. And it reads, Lucy Dick Slow, pioneer friend and leader of college women. Now, um, I want to say um, the most important sign of belonging is the fact that this tradition continued for 45 years and Dean Slow was alive for only 15 of them. And so what I have here are a couple of newspaper articles talking about when the dinner was in its fourth decade in 1955, where you had 500 alumni, students and guests gathered for what had become not just an evening, but a weekend long celebration. And the woman who presided over this said, Howard was still an educational jungle when Lucy Slow arrived in the sense that it accepted women on the faculty grudgingly, that it paid them lower salaries than men, and that it considered its dean of women a dormitory preceptress or a house mother with a college education. It was Lucy Slow's task to bring to this university the conception of the Howard co-ed who studies and gets her work because that is what she is here for mainly. Because Lucy Slow set up that ideal on this campus and persuaded the students to follow after it, tonight we have this dinner. dinner. And so it was in this great spirit of gratitude of understanding the power of Dean Slow's leadership of that, that they showed what belonging meant to them and how she created this lingering affective sense of connection that they lovingly maintain for, as I said, 45 years until 1967. And so this is my last slide, um, and I just want to say a little bit. The title of the book is To Live More Abundantly, and I take that from her eulogy. The full line reads, she gave the last measure of devotion that girls, all girls, might live more abundantly. And to me, this is the heart of her audacity. The repetition and the emphasis on girls, all girls, attends to specifically to Slow's vision of ensuring that Black college women really mattered, that they had inherent value and that they deserved our care and our best efforts. To me, this is a kind of belonging which not only retains students and graduates them, but cultivates leaders in the world beyond their undergraduate years. And so this is one of my favorite photos in the book. I think I have about 12 in there where you have Dean Slow right here, um, surrounded by 150 of her girls. I think they exude the qualities of living more abundantly, um, self-respect, self-determination and a commitment to community as well as to joy. And underneath I have words taken by one of the first women who was affected by Dean Slow, who then became a, um, a Dean of Women at a couple of different HBCUs. Um, and for her example and her audacious belief in black women, I believe that Lucy Dick Slow continues to be an inspiration and a foremother in the long arc of making higher education inclusive in practice and not just in its professed words. Thank you. Thank you.
My goodness, you have taken us through in this period of time, all of the emotions we, we, we got <laughs> excited and, um, and, and then was playful and then it takes a turn and then, yeah. then we did, we don't feel quite as good. Um, <laughs> So that this is it's a fascinating story. And for you to have given us the that story in this amount of time, it, it's really very impressive. Thank you so much. I feel like I have learned a lot. Awesome. If you have questions, we have a few minutes for questions. And so if you want to put those into the chat, I can read them. Or if you would prefer to just unmute yourself and ask your question, that's fine too. Um, and it looks like we have a question in the chat yes. from Lily. Yes, and I was just going to say, it looks like we're having our own women's dinner right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah, kind of impromptu or yeah, you know, serendipitous. Yeah, right. bunch, bunch of women together is still a little scary, maybe. <laughs> Um, let's see. Lily says, I have really loved this presentation and I'm interested in how her legacy influenced the other deans of women, especially after their visit to Howard, were other colleges able to introduce similar events like the women's dinner yeah. on their campuses. This yeah. also makes me yeah. think about the importance of women's colleges and wonder if the leadership of those institutions were more equal in the gender balance. Yeah, okay, um, there was a lot there and I addressed some of it in the book. So one of the things that Dean Slow did is that she was always sort of founding organizations to meet needs. So you had the National Associ Association of Deans of Women, but then she had a parallel organization that she founded for Deans of Women at HBCU, HBCUs. And that's where she tried to grow it among, you know, in, 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 in these colleges and universities. And, um, in terms of the traditions that were taken up, I don't know. I would love for somebody, you know, a graduate student to see like beyond Lucy Slow, she was the first, you know, and I've done a deep dive, but there are other people who look at some of the people who, who became deans because of her, you know, the black women. So at some point she had this club for deans of women in the making, like an undergraduate club. I was thinking it'd be so fascinating to take this photo and we know, I think the names of some of them and to see where they went. So I know that she had impact, but I can't tell you specifically, apart from that she had this organization, it still exists, it's merged with Black um, or Deans of Men, and so it's a national association of um, uh, sorry, student affairs professionals, so N-A-S-A-P. Um, but that was her whole thing is that she didn't want this to be just at Howard. She wanted to start a movement. Also, there's a lot of interesting work, and I think it's in chapter four of my book, which talks about her, the color line that was drawn in her professional organization, um, the white women dominated National Association of Deans of Women. So I point to a couple examples where they're talking about women, but they definitely hold to a, a color line. Um, there are too many examples of the national meeting being held in spaces where black women could not um, could not eat with their white colleagues, where they could not get lodging in the headquarter hotels. There's a particularly egregious example, and actually Dean Slow and some of the black, and I think almost all the black women boycotted this last um, conference in 1937, so the year that she died where they held it in New Orleans and they sort of blasted. Now, granted, they were working with their parent organization, but the whole draw to New Orleans that sold out the, um, the, um, the hotels well before the conference was that it was going to be about Dixie. And so they had like voodoo something, they had mammies, they had children singing, but it was all about this like romanticized sense of the Southern past. And Dean Slow wrote to the leadership of her, of the National Association of Deans of Women and said, how can you expect anyone to be able to attend this? And in addition, there was the, 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 the familiar slight of the, the Black women couldn't find lodging in the headquarter hotels. So she boycotted that. Um, there is a white woman who I'm forgetting right now. She was a Dean of Women at Holland's College, I think. And she was one white woman who got it and who worked with Dean Slow and said, I will carry your message of outrage to the organization. And there were some changes that were made, but I would say the organization, like many white organizations, never quite understood their role in creating segregation. Um, they kind of, they, as happens now, they expected Black women to sort of make changes without them having to do anything on their side. 
So there is, so I don't know if that speaks to your question. I mean, you asked a lot of important things, but there was impact and there was also resistance that she got from her home institution, Harvard University, but also from her professional organization. And she had to create alternative spaces for what she saw as um, a need for Black women to, to be deans of women at HBCUs, but also for Black women students. So she had another organization that tried to raise, that raised money, that encouraged Black women to go to college, um, and that also surveyed schools to see what, they, what was going on. How were, how were women being represented in the student groups that were available and also in the administration? So she was hoping that higher ed could be what she expected it to be, a democratic space where people could learn from and with each other is beyond the stereotypes that she knew they came in with. There's this wonderful example of an exchange with a white dean at Boston College who's asking Dean Slow what she should do. There were black women who were admitted and um, she didn't know where to put them. And some people in the black community said, don't put them on campus because they're gonna be harmed. And, and some people said, no, they should be part of the student body. And Dean Slow said, basically, if people come to school with narrow views of their worth and also of other people, it's the school's obligation to broaden them. Those girls should be with their peers. And it's on the institution and the dean of women to make that be a positive experience. And so I think there, that's another reason why I see her as really important in the sort of long arc of, of inclusion. What are the kinds of audacious, people you need to have in higher ed who don't repeat the traditions. So there's an author who talks about PWIs and I referenced her uh, word, her word change, not predominantly white institutions, but persistently white. What keeps these institutions, um, spaces just have low numbers of um, African-Americans or other racially minoritized groups? What are the things that keep change from happening? And I think Dean still had some examples there. Oh my God, I think I see somebody I recognize. I'm, T, is that you? Oh my God. Oh, it's so, me, hi. <laughs> oh, we have to catch up. So I'm so happy that you're in the room with us as we're having our own little sort of women's, cent uh, women's dinner gathering. We, I well, know just, that we're, I'm sorry, oh, go ahead. Can we're, I we're ask right up on our time, really quickly? But let's make okay. That. So one, I just want to say thank you. I learned so much. I knew who she was, but I had no idea the depth of her, her contributions to Howard. And I'm just wondering, after her death, um, were the women students able to regain any of what they had lost? You know, was the president remorseful at all? And, you know, did he reinstitute no. anything? No. He stayed okay. on until 1963. No. And that's another chapter that needs to be written. I know the person who became the interim dean of women, the, the women students called out as the high-handed Hitler of the administration. She did not have, she did not share the vision. And so I know that they pushed back, but I don't know what happened afterwards, but there must have been some traction between the alumni who were in the area and the, the director of, of the women's physical education program because this dinner continued. And so there must have been at least some of the spaces that she had, but I don't know enough about the person who um, succeeded her to know how much of, the, of their vision aligned with her own. But the president, um, he was there from what, 1926 to 1963. I mean, a huge amount of time. There was even an attempt after, oh, I'm telling you, we need another hour. Um, she was on her deathbed and the president sent to her secretary um, an ultimatum that she was either to return to start the school year and the, her, and the fact and the state of her illness was reported in the black press. Like people were like, people, the family, it's being called. Like they knew that she was on her deathbed, but he sent this letter saying that she either had to report to campus or name her successor. Um, and so there's a certain kind, and then at, at later that year, so she died in October, in December, the alumni um, group got together and in their magazine, they had this great like statement where they wanted him voted out. You know, they thought that this was egregious and they focus on this example of how ill-suited he was for governing the campus. I haven't got enough to figure out why he was retained, but it's so public, you know, um, the, the tension between him and other people, and yet there were forces that kept them in place well beyond her, her, her life. Um, but T, you're a historian, and I'm telling you, like, I, I used to get resentful when the faculty members would say, oh, that's a good idea, someone should research it. 
But this is one of those cases where there is so much we don't know. Um, black women's physical education, like what that what space that held for black women in particular, who were told that their bodies were wrong to have a space where they can sort of get strong and feel pleasure. That's a story that needs to be written. The relationships between deans of women and these athletic directors focused on women. That's another history. So um, yeah, I wish I had better answers, but I, I know that the stuff is there and we just need people to attend to it. It may be that what we should really do is we, we have the hour for the presentation and then we have an hour for just talk about all the things that have come to mind <laughs> is that there there's also a really good comment over here in the chat about her relationship to alpha kappa alpha which if we have not talked about no much. no and she was very careful so what's really important is that she created this women's league which happened on many of these campuses i mean that was just a standard protocol and it was a it was this organization that every woman belonged to and it ran the women's dinner or it you know yeah it created the, it ran the women's dinner it had a women's loan fund it had a couple other activities um that it, it it supported and she was very careful although she was proud of her membership she knew that she didn't want there to be spaces that were exclusive to any black woman on campus so she was very careful not to align herself with aka um, and to say that I'm here for all the women, because there were, at that time, I think there were at least three um, black sororities on Howard's campus, and you could see how she could be seen as a partisan um, actor, but she said, no, we need a super organization that everyone belongs. And also what I saw in the newspaper is that you started to have conversations where black women would say, what have we become? And so in some ways, having the, this women's league reminded AKA and some of the other sororities, like they were not supposed to be I think somebody said like footstools to the men, like, you know, the, that they had sort of lost the, I would say black feminist grounds that they had come from and become more sort of in this um, heterosexual space where men were once again taking the lead. So in some ways being Dean of women allowed her to rewind women. There is a broader sense of self that even sometimes these sororities can forget. Well, Afton and I were commenting when we got on and we saw this picture that, um, that that people are not necessarily smiling in the big picture. And I now have a whole different understanding of why that yeah, might be. Yeah. Now I read that a little bit like, bring it on. I think so. so That's the way I saw it, you know, and I think it was, you know, during the winter, but still, I think it's a bring it on and we are poor. It's like, you mess with one, you mess with all. That's still what I took from it. Yeah, but that feels like a good note to end on. We are so, so delighted to have had you here with us today, to have had everybody who is here in the audience. Please join us for other events at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. Um, we hope to see you again. Thanks, yeah, thanks for the time and the opportunity. It's been wonderful. Take Thank care, you. everybody.